it's my pleasure to be joined today by Mr. Patrick Coburn, uh, Middle East correspondent for The Independent, uh, renowned war correspondent over the years, and perhaps member of the most uh, decorated journalist family that I've ever heard of, certainly perhaps ever in the English-speaking world. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask you firstly about journalism in general. You talk a lot in the book about oversimplification and how Western media tend to take a really basic outlook at often very complex events. Um, what's your advice to people like me who are budding journalists to try and have a real in-depth, multifaceted view like yourself? Do I have to be there? Do I have to live it? <laughs> I think a lot of it's very simple. It's just, you know, don't do that, you know. Realize that, you know, life is multifaceted. Don't totally demonize one guy, even if he's a demon, you know. Like Saddam Hussein was pretty demonic, but he wasn't the only thing wrong with Iraq, nor Gaddafi of Libya or Assad of uh, Syria. But the sort of demonization of single rulers, um, you know, is very misleading for anybody uh, whom one's trying to communicate with. But also very bad, I think, for, you know, opposition within these countries, because I think we get rid of Saddam, everything will be okay. And of course, we know it wasn't, it was never likely to be. Some of this is difficult to do, you should be there, but some of it, I think, is quite easy, which is just to approach it with a, a skeptical, open, non-partisan, skeptical mind. Um, and whoever tells you something, you know, they tell it to you for a reason, it's always partisan. It doesn't mean they're lying, but that's the truth as they see it. Right. But you need to, you know, see a diversity and always be sceptical about that. Now, this sounds incredibly obvious. It is incredibly obvious. But then you can look at whole screes of journalism, and they're all, you know, all the sins come from one source. All right. the mistakes come from... The other thing is, you know, sources. If you look at the New York Times, you know, it's, it's always sources are revealed to the New York Times. So why do they reveal things to the New York Times? You know, because it's in their interest. That isn't admitted. Uh, you know, it gives a picture of a world which are full of these saintly characters who tell you secret and confidential information. They don't. They're doing it, you know, for reasons which seem good to them, often to do with their own career, often the betterment of their own organization. Um, again, it's not, why does this happen? Well, I think journalists don't really want to um, admit they're often a conduit of information uh, that others are putting out. Uh, they want to feel that they, you know, they're somehow getting the truth. Right. And uh, does it still anger you? I, I imagine since sort of the haziness of like 9/11 and that, or since at least maybe perhaps Bush's second administration when lies were revealed and everything. Do you think people's views are starting to kind of correlate more with yours? They have a more skeptical attitude, as you say they should. To a degree, you know, and one would hope they should because you know. There's an invasion of Iraq, they get rid of Saddam Hussein, you know, the, the subsequent history of Iraq has not been good, whatever side you're on. Right. Um, but along comes Libya, and they do exactly the same thing. They get rid of uh, uh, Gaddafi, and look at the state of um, Libya today. It's run by the, you know, these uh, criminalized warlords. Likewise in Syria, so there, there doesn't seem to be a learning curve, certainly among governments. To some degree, maybe there is in, among public, but, you know, I wonder, you know, journalists, certainly in Libya, were not very skeptical about what would replace Gaddafi, or whether anything would replace Gaddafi. Or whether they had a plan at all. Or, or, or whether guys to have a plan, you know, or were these, you know, these gunmen, um, uh, who did they represent? You know, it... it it's partly, you know, PR has developed. I remember in Benghazi in Libya, who was, um, you know, there was a spokesman for the opposition who spoke excellent English, very civilized woman, and so forth. You know, then when the opposition, you know, transitional government came later in 2011 to uh, Tripoli, I remember the first thing they announced was they were abolishing Gaddafi's ban on polygamy. Oh, yeah, I read you know, that. You could tell where these guys were coming from. So I think that there, there needs to be sort of. Uh, Obviously, there needs to be skepticism, but I'd like to think there was a learning curve, but you can't quite see it. Right. And this, and this, so this discrepancy that's just been there almost your entire career between you and Western intelligence, is that down mainly to their self-interest? I mean, do they know these things and keep it to themselves, or is it really just as I much of a con as... I don't know the answer to that, you know. 
some things seem so obvious, uh, and yet they did them anyway. Sometimes it emerges subsequently that there were guys in intelligence who were saying, you know, warning about Islamic State in Iraq and Syria in 2014, but nobody listened to them, you know, or so they say. You know, 2003, it turns out there were loads of people in Britain and America, in, high up in the government and the civil service, who thought it was a really bad idea to invade Iraq and uh, so forth. But, you know, they say that now, but did they really say it then? And did they do anything about it? Yeah. And what are the limitations of war journalism? I mean, it's hard to, for me to know. I mean, I know we can, we can definitely influence the academic world, but what's on these, on these victims that you describe um, in the Middle East, the, the real sufferers of, of the conditions, how could we help them? Well, you know, first of all, you know, what do journalists do? You know, you find out something, you tell the public about it. That's it, really. That's 95% of it. Uh, so you tell the, try and tell the truth, you know. I mean, it sounds goody-goody, and you know, but it's not that easy. Uh, so I think one tries to do that. Um, and then, you know, one tries, one, one shouldn't, it used to be pompous about this, we'll talk about being the voice of the voiceless, and stuff like that. I find that a bit patronizing, but, you know, put in the simpler terms, yeah, you know, I do try to sort of report on terrible things that happen people don't know about. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to do it more, you know, Yemen. Uh, you know, one knows all these terrible things are happening, bombings, you know, some of these get publicity, most don't. Um, but uh, I try to do that. Um, and try to tell people things that they wouldn't know otherwise. I mean, some, a lot of these things are easy to state, but they aren't necessarily easy to do. Yeah. And also, you know, try to knock down things that one thinks are exaggerated and untrue, like we're talking about Libya, you know, that during the Libyan war, perhaps more than most, there, there were tremendous, you know, high-profile atrocity stories, you know, that Gaddafi had ordered the mass rape of um, women, you know, in opposition areas. And this was widely broadcast and did a lot for to uh, get support for the overthrow of Gaddafi, you know. Now, <clears throat> uh, a woman had claimed that she'd uh, distributed, can you imagine, in the middle of the war, she'd done it with 70,000 questionnaires distributed in uh, uh, eastern Libya in the middle of the war. 50,000 are returned. You wouldn't get that in Hampstead. Um, and all these people claimed that they'd been raped by... So then, this is widely reported, but then, not just me, you know, but human rights organizations, Amnesty, right. go to the woman and say, could we see some of these? She doesn't have any of them. Uh, could they get any of the names of these people? No, she can't do that. It becomes apparent to everybody that it, this is an invention. It's just simply not true. But, of course, the people who invent these things, and somebody sits down, these things that really don't happen by accident, right. knows but that by the time they're discredited, they've done their work. You know. And this goes back a long time. I remember, I don't know, you recall 1990, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. I mean, a really bad thing to do. But then one of the stories that really got people upset was uh, a woman who claimed she was in a hospital in Kuwait. She was Kuwaiti, and Iraqi soldiers had gone into the uh, unit in the hospital where there were uh, babies uh, in uh, uh, special, uh, with special facilities, you know, and tipped up babies out onto the floor. Horrific stuff. Except she would turn out to be the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador in, in, in Washington. She'd never been there. It didn't happen. Right. Pretty shocking. And in terms of a source for that Libyan lie, do, do we know where that, where that source is? Well, somebody just... in Vail and a woman invented it. I don't, I, right. but I, first of all, I don't know how it was. In, some of these things have the feel that somebody who, you know, who had an agenda sat down and thought, this is what I'm going to do. Right, it just seems like such an extravagant That it line. isn't just, it might be, but isn't just, you know, uh, an individual who decides to concoct this story right. to make a point. Exactly. I, I think it's a bit simple-minded to imagine the world works like that. Well, the, the, the way the world's currently working, as you describe it, 
is that there are eight or nine ongoing wars in the region from, I think you describe it as, is it the Western Pakistan border all the way to yeah. North Africa? What, I mean, we're talking obviously about Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, mm -hmm. Somalia, North Sudan, is that included as well in your account? Uh, Sudan, yeah. It's um, uh, particularly one, South Sudan. It's, I mean, at that, that point you begin to get towards Central Africa, so it's slightly right. different. But, uh, yeah. And out of, out of this kind of melee this, of violence, is there something like an event that in your lifetime you would like to see that would reinstill some kind of optimism, perhaps like demilitarization of Assad's regime, defeat of ISIS, something that you think might turn the table slightly towards a more positive outlook? I'm or is it too complicated for that? ISIS, I think ISIS uh, was sui generis. I think it, uh, you know, it deliberately, it depended on sectarianism, it deliberately uh, fueled sectarianism. Uh, you know, the way they'd work in Baghdad and elsewhere would be, you might have some district with like, some ISIS guys there, you know, they'd go and kill some Shia in a neighboring district, the Shia would, you know, in a probably a pretty atrocious way, the Shia would come back and uh, kill some Sunni in that area, and then people in that area would have no alternative but to look to ISIS to defend them. Yes. So they were continually provoking and exacerbating uh, sectarianism. And you could say that, that on a small scale they did with assassinations, but also massacres of uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, so I think the elimination of ISIS is very important. Um, I think, you know, in Syria, I don't think we're going to get a demilitarized Syria. I'm not going to get a demilitarized Iraq, but it is important just to get the level of violence down, to have ceasefires. Uh, you know, you, you've got to. It's very easy to say, you know, I wish for this, but it should be attached to what's really attainable. Right. And I, I think if you could get more, you get ceasefires in Syria, even if it's like old Lebanese ceasefires. There might have been 600 ceasefires during the Lebanese Civil War, which was 15 years. And people used to laugh at them, you know, and so forth. But lot, generally, lot less people got killed during ceasefires than at other times. Right. And I think it's necessary because I think you can't, all these other ideas people have about power sharing and so forth, you can't do that when people are trying to kill each other. It's what Northern Ireland used to call the politics of the last atrocity. You had atrocities that determined the agenda. You couldn't, you couldn't really compromise or negotiate or anything else. Right. So you need to get that down. That in itself, to a degree, demilitarized politics as well. Other people could join it. When you've got a war, uh, you know, the guys who determine the agenda, determine what goes on, tend to be the toughest fighters, the most committed, the guys who are prepared to get killed. Who are they in Syria? They're uh, ISIS, they're al yeah. Well, that's why. Are they prepared for a ceasefire? How would Depends one negotiate? For them. You say this is a big question. You know, we had this failed ceasefire recently in uh, this September. Uh, it failed, you know, for a number of reasons that uh, maybe it was never going to do it. But, you know, one of the reasons was there was nothing in it for al Nusra. Right. Um, uh, nothing in it for ISIS. But, uh, you know, the um, that moderate armed opposition was supposed to separate themselves from al-Nusra. But actually one knows that it can't really be done because the Islamists dominate the armed opposition. Right. Um, More so today, am I correct in saying? I think today I read some news about um, an Islamist opposition joining forces with a non-Islamist opposition. Yeah, they do it because, one, they'll probably get killed if they didn't. And secondly, al-Nusra is popular, you know. Hmm. It's, they, these aren't, you know, ISIS is often unpopular but, uh, because of their savagery and so forth, but often al-Nusra is quite is popular in these areas, that these groups, hmm. uh, one, it would be very dangerous to move away from al-Nusra, but secondly, th these are the guys they've been fighting alongside, they're brothers in arms. Hmm. It's not purely intimidation that they join up, that they kind of believe in the same thing. Yeah. And you, you touched there on sectarianism. I know for a fact, I mean, my parents coming from where we discussed off camera earlier, coming from Iraq in the 1970s, they seem to hold the view that a lot of moderate Muslims do that this Shia Sunni thing arose out of nowhere, that it's this new kind of thing rather than an ancient struggle as others seem to try and paint it. What's your view on well, that? First of all, you always had differences between Sunni yeah. and Shia. They were destroying Shia mosques in Baghdad, uh, you know, in the year 1000, you know, uh, in al Qadimiyah, and, um, you know, in villages you would Sunni villages, Shia villages, people didn't live together, you know, so there were differences. 
but the sort of acute sectarianism, uh, you know, is modern. You know, where did it come from? Well, a number of sources. You know, the Iranian Revolution. Uh, initially, they Khomeini saw this as pan-Islamic, but then during the Iraqi Iran Iraq War, it became pan-Shia. Really, um, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan set off sort of Sunni jihadis. But perhaps you know, just as important is the way in which Wahhabism has come to uh, dominate or uh, influence mainstream Sunni Islam. This wasn't true 100 years ago or 80 years ago. And it's done it because uh, it's backed by Saudi money. You know, the Saudi state and uh, the Wahhabi clergy have always historically yeah. been uh, dependent on each other and still are. Uh, so, you know, you want to set up a... Uh, small mosque in Bangladesh and you need twenty thousand dollars. There's only one place you can go. Of course. Where are all these people trained, you know? So I think that that is a big change in Wahhabism. It's not quite the same as the ideology of Islamic State, but it's story on Nusra, but it's not far. Salafi away. Wahhabi. Salafi right. jihadi um, beliefs. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is a big change and that has exacerbated sectarianism. Yeah. Uh, you did say, right, that there's only two places in the world that women can't drive. It's Islamic State and Saudi Arabia. Sure, yeah. You know, in the House of Saud, they probably feel, you know, they can, some of them feel they can use the Wahhabis, you know, but get rid of them when they want, and the Wahhabis feel the same thing about the House of Saud. I doubt if either can do it. Right. And in terms of British foreign policy towards this... Melio, how would you like to see it change? Do you think we're going to see troops in Syria at any point? Do you think we're going to see troops back in Iraq at any point? Is that something well, you'd I like to see? Not, uh, you know, one, there's no public support for this. Quite the opposite. Which British had, public support, you mean? British public support, yeah. And there isn't American public support either. Yeah. But I suppose if there were some, you know, terrorist attacks in central London, this might change, same in America. Right. I don't, it's not there at the moment. Also, you know, these foreign intervention create a lot of these problems more foreign intervention will create more of these problems in different ways. Uh, you know, you look at you look at the American British intervention in Iraq two thousand three, but you know, look at the American uh, intervention in Lebanon in nineteen eighty two, you know, or the Israelis, what happened there? Um, there was a counter reaction uh, very soon. So um, British foreign policy, what is it? It seems to sort of kinda of go along with what the Saudis and Turkey and the Gulf Sunni states want. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem very enterprising, you know, this day that we're talking on it. You know, um, Boris Johnson said he'd like to see people demonstrating outside the Russian embassy. Yeah, yeah. making but a full 360 on his what? own. He making, made a full 360 well, on his own. entirely different from what he said previously, yeah. but uh, leave that aside. <laughs> when foreign ministers were reduced for calling for demonstrations, you know that they don't have anything new to say themselves. You know? Right. Yeah. And I imagine American foreign policy is going to take some changing now, perhaps. Uh, what do you think about the kind of the presidential run? I, I know that they are in the second debate they mentioned briefly their approaches to, very vaguely, their approaches to Syria, with uh, Clinton saying that she's going to resume Obama's way of militarizing the Iraqi Kurds, also insinuated that she's going to um, militarize the Syrian Kurds to Turkey's dismay. Donald Trump says he's a fan of Syria, of the Kurds. What do you think? What well, are the it's dangers safe of that? To say you love the Kurds until you betray them, you know. Yeah. And uh, the Kurds know that. The Kurds are in a peculiar position because they've done pretty well as our boys, um, the West's boys, the ground troops, um, uh, with uh, Western air power uh, backing them up. But they've also, you know, in Iraq, they've taken over disputed territories, territories disputed with. Uh, Arabs that's increased the Turkish the Kurdish controlled area by about forty percent in similarly in um, Syrian Kurdish areas you know that in northern Syria uh, a lot of this was you know a lot of Arab villages Arab places there that the Arabs have been pushed out or have left um, and they know there are only about two point two million uh, Syrian Kurds. Uh, they're in a very vulnerable position. Vulner if the war ends, if ISIS disappears, if Damascus is back, they, that's dangerous for them. If the Turks, that's another enemy. Uh, and they depend on having the U.S. and others as, as their allies. But if there's no more ISIS, 
then that, uh, what's the point of that alliance to the Americans, you know? And there are two million uh, Syrian Kurds and there are 80 million people in Turkey. So, you know, they, they wonder what the long-term outcome of this is going to be. Yeah. And this, and this kind of demonization that you spoke of earlier, of a, of a demon in Saddam Hussein, are we doing that again now with Russia, Iran, Syria, that's, that axis? Are we sure, yeah. Is that so? That sure, continues yeah. that narrative. Yeah, and you know, of course, of course, you know, to shoot down Russian aircraft. These things are going to happen. I mean, they're kind of childish, but unfortunately, they sort of prevent discussion of real things to prevent people getting killed. You know, um, how do you know? Can you evacuate the civilian population from uh, Mosul? From uh, from Mosul, from Aleppo. You know. Um, then again, you know what's happened with the Russians. East Aleppo, they're obviously bombarding, they're obviously killing a lot of civilians, but hold on a minute, you know, what happened to Ramadi? You know, the biggest city in, uh, in Anbar province in, um, in, in Iraq, you know, that um, it's, it, there's nothing left, you know, it's destroyed. Uh, Fallujah, some people are going back, you know, uh, but um, I think that just by sort of blaming it all on the Russians, Syrian government. You know, this is uh, very sort of juvenile. Yeah. And in a way, you know, the whole Western you know, British policy is sort of based on myths, you know, that somehow we don't have to choose between Assad and the Islamists, extreme Islamists, because there are these armed uh, moderates, you know, 70,000 of them, according to uh, David Cameron. You know, and you have journalists and others who talk about this as real. You know, the one thing I've always noticed, though, it's people who say that there are these Syrian armed moderates, these guys, if they're powerful, they must control territory. They never actually go to territory in Syria held by these people. Why don't they? Because they know they'd end up in the boot of a car immediately. They get kidnapped. Because mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't hold any territory. They're yeah. not there. I suppose it's a deep human feeling of needing to take a side. Is that perhaps the reason? Taking a side, but herd instinct as well. You know, it's kind of it's perhaps safer to say that. You know, a lot of this is herd instinct. But in Syria, it's sort of a little depressing from the point of view of a journalist. People have whole articles, you know, based on secondary sources, you know, citizen activists they've never met, they know over the internet or in East Aleppo or somewhere else. Uh, they're not actually there. And, but they're much more certain about what's happening than people who have been in different parts of Syria. I've been in different right. parts of Syria, but you know, I'm very uncertain a lot of the time what's happening. Yeah. You find these people being are completely certain about what's happening, they're wholly partisan, but they're not never actually been, you just suddenly discover they've never been to Syria. They've never yeah. been there for five, six years. Right. I mean, there's a parallel. I was saying somebody actually in Syria, you know, it's, it's, you know, it'd be rather like trying to, the BBC was reporting the presidential election in the US with their correspondent based in Canada, and his main source was the Trump campaign. <laughs> you know, this would not be uh, very accurate. And his output would be he's certain that Trump is going to win the election, right? It's a, if Trump will be in there with a chance, yeah. yeah. Did you ever consider abandoning your job, perhaps in a, in a situation of particular danger? You know, it's not. You know, it's, first of all, you know, I try and limit the danger, and. I've always found you know, it's actually quite easy to be brave if you're not with your family. You've got your family or your children with you. Then you really get frightened. I remember a guy in um, uh, a friend of mine in, in uh, Beirut during the war. The same one I do now is I, I was partly living in Beirut at the time, late 70s, early 80s. Well, he said, Why don't you move here permanently? And so I was dangerous. People say, He said, One thing you can't bring your family with you. Because that every time you hear a bang, you think it's your kids have just been. Right. Uh, but of course, people who live there, they have to live with that. Their family, their children are there. Uh, that's far worse. Um, it's dangerous. It's not. I used to think the young journalists who get killed because they don't want to make a name of their name. Actually, it's older journalists who tend to get killed because they get blase. They think. Right. They've been doing it so long. They One more. You're, than... you're going to away with it 99 times out of 100. But the 100th time you don't. You know? Yeah. And has your, how have your political views managed? How have they held up throughout all these years? Have you become more radical in one way or another, or how have they morphed? 
I think they probably have. I mean, um, my sort of skepticism about anything that governments do has probably increased. Certainly since 2000. Since 2001, you know, this book I've just done is really the Afghan war from 2001, then the Iraq war 2003, and the, the wars in Iraq, then it changes a little bit, 2011, the war in, more moves to Syria, Libya, other places. Um, my, the degree to which government's responsible for this, the degree to which they acted wholly in their own interests, yeah, I think it's become more disgusting as time goes on, particularly in Syria. Um, there are things they could have done uh, to prevent it getting so bad. Is it more disgusting or more transparent to us all now, perhaps? Well, yeah, I suppose so, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, everybody blames Tony Blair in Britain for the invasion of Iraq and so forth. But, you know, David Cameron never seemed to get blamed for uh, his actions in Libya, which destroyed Libya. Right. He probably played more of uh, a decisive role in Libya than uh, Tony Blair did in Iraq. The Americans going to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, so um, didn't really seem to damage him. Yeah. And current policy on Syria you know, seems to be completely bankrupt and has been bankrupt for some time. You know. Um, but. It doesn't seem to damage the government very much. Well, I'll conclude, Mr. Coburn. This book was was absolutely riveting. It's kind of like a diaristic guide, starting from 2001 with the um, U.S.-led invasion into Afghanistan and leading to the present day. I do have a final question, though. One of my somebody I know once told me that war correspondence was easier than regular correspondence because all you've got to do is not die, and everywhere you go and everywhere you talk to is a story. What do you have to say to that? Um, it's not really, because a lot of the time you're waiting around for things to happen, you know. But once it is happening, to some extent, the story writes itself, you know. But then if you're going to do it properly, you have to realize, you know, it's not just the bang-bang, other things are happening, you know. Uh, I covered the Iraq, you know, the, the Afghan world war in 2001. The thing that struck me, actually, there was very little fighting. You wouldn't have gained that, understood that from TV. No. Because uh, people are meant to be covering the fighting, you know, and... So they don't say, well, actually, there isn't much fun. But I, you know, I went from Kabul to Kandahar, you know, and it was very clear the Taliban were going home. You know? Right. You said the same about Iraq, right? With... Yeah, there wasn't much fighting then, but then the, it became more and more violent, you know. Sure. So, so people have a certain conception of war, or what war is like. Right. And this is true not just of individuals, but television stations and editors and so forth. It's dramatized. Hmm? Dramatized, right? It's drama and, you know, and so forth. Um... But, you know, it, it, the actual bang-bang is only part of it, you know. It's an essential part, but there are other parts of it. Yeah. So to cover war in general, not just combat, but war in general is very complicated. Right. Sure it is. Thank you so much for speaking to me. It's an honor. Thank you.